Welcome to Todd Talks, where my guest today is Dr. Russell D. Moore. Dr. Moore, who needs little to no introduction for the vast majority of those who will listen to this conversation, currently serves as Editor-in-Chief for Christianity Today and Director of the Public Theology Project at Christianity Today. Before Dr. Moore assumed his present roles, he served as President of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention and as Dean of the School of Theology, Senior Vice President for Academic Administration, and as Professor of Theology and Ethics at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. You will be delighted to hear that I will not seek to rehearse all of Dr. Moore's considerable CV here, but let me add to what I've said that he's married to Maria and that they are the parents of five sons. Russell, thank you for taking the time out of what must be a full to overflowing schedule to join me on Todd Talks. Oh, it's an honor to be with you. Thanks for having me. I'm so pleased you're here. Russell, our conversation could go any number of directions as we've gotten to know one another over time. I'm just fascinated. You may be one of the best conversationalists I've ever met. <laughs> Having said that, we got to go somewhere instead of everywhere. And so I thought, to borrow a line from The Sound of Music, <laughs> that we might start at the very beginning, for it's a very good place to start. Okay. All right. So uh, please, sh I mean, people may well know Russell Moore, the public figure, but I wonder sometimes if people know Russell Moore, the person, Russell Moore, the Christ follower, Russell Moore, the pastor. So would you please tell us a bit about your upbringing and how it is that you became a Christ follower in the first place? I grew up in Biloxi, Mississippi, uh, in the church that my grandfather had pastored uh, before I was born. Uh, but Bull Market Baptist Church, a really close uh, community there, and I was there from before birth uh, on, uh, and there all the time. And so my, a, a really important figure in my life was my grandmother, uh, who was the pastor's widow uh, there. She lived next door. And my parents made sure that I was at Sunday school and Sunday morning church. She made sure I was there for everything else. And there was a lot else, <laughs> uh, except for... Every time the doors were open. Every time the doors were open, except for business meetings. One Wednesday night a month, she would say, not tonight, it's business meeting. So I just assumed business meeting meant you didn't go. Uh, and later I said, why did we never go to business meeting? And she said, because I wanted you to be a Christian. I didn't want you to see. <laughs> she was trying what, to protect you. She was trying to protect me, <laughs> which I understand now. But, uh, but so I grew up in that, uh, in that context, experienced a called to ministry really early, um, about the age of 12, not, not long after I had come to Christ. And uh, that church nurtured me uh, in that. But I, I sort of walked away from it and uh, ended up working in politics and government uh, for a while until I was working on Capitol Hill for a U.S. congressman. And the Library of Congress would have discard books uh, that you could take. And I had a stack of books. And that night when I was sort of going through them, there was a manual, pastor's manual on weddings and funerals. You know, you're just getting these books so quickly. And I thought, why did I want that? And that really prompted the reconsideration of, of uh, a call to ministry. So went wow. from there. Wow. So, um, Speaking of uh, this kind of uh, reigniting of this call, which came early, uh, you spent much of your young adult years and early career receiving and investing in theological education. Right. Mm -hmm. So, Russell, share with us why you think that theological education is so important to you on the one hand and why it should be arguably important to the church and those who seek to serve the church uh, on the other? Well, I think theological education is important both in terms of content skills. I, I think we can understand how that uh, benefits. But I also think it's important in terms of forming community 
early on. Uh, there's a there's a way in which it's not just what the student learns, but the way intuitions are are shaped, mm -hmm. and you have uh, for so many of us, we uh, sort of find people early on in those years of uh, studying Hebrew together or studying New Testament together uh, that then will be part of our lives for the rest of our lives. Yes. And that's that's really significant. So there, it's not just the things that you can verify and sort of mark on the transcript as important as those are. There's another invisible transcript that comes mm -hmm. with that that I find is even more important sometimes. J.V. Lightfoot used to talk about to his students at Cambridge the highest reason and the fullest faith. Mm -hmm. And it seems in some ways that you're not only, as you're suggesting, after rigorous academic instruction, but also intentional spiritual formation. Yes, intentional and spiritual formation. And it seems that uh, so often those who lose their way in ministry may lose their way more in the latter than the former. Yes, and sometimes it's because of isolation. Yeah. Uh, because so often in ministry, uh, even if one doesn't intend to do this, you can end up in a situation where everyone else appears to be competitors. Mm -hmm. uh, e even if, if you don't intend right. for that to be the case, right. there's always the sense that maybe, maybe it is. So you can be in ministry in a particular community and find yourself isolated with no one really to honestly be a, a check. And then what happens is people end up finding various ways to shut down and to, to numb themselves. And that becomes really dangerous. Where if there's a community of people, you know, you know where to go. Uh, sometimes that's a professor who was really intentional about mentoring and shaping. Sometimes it's fellow classmates. Uh, that, it, it just cannot be overestimated how important that is mm -hmm. in those really crisis moments that everyone's going to experience. Or just um, I, right before I uh, came in here, I have a text with one of my former uh, classmates from years ago hmm. saying, I, I need you to call me because I have a, uh, a am I crazy uh, okay. question about a pastoral uh, situation yeah. where he's wondering, am I making the right decision? And I've given him many of those calls from my own end, and that you, you need that. Yeah. 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 A check and balance. A check and balance, as, yeah. as, it, as it were. So however uh, theological education is delivered, uh, whether in person, digitally, somehow, some way, you're going to have to form community. Yes. Because yes. ministry is simply too hard to go it alone. Right. Right. And, and a lot of that uh, the part of the difficulty is that a lot of it, it's organic. Yeah. It, it can't be scheduled as yeah. here's community time. Yeah. A lot of it is the just the natural uh, as you're working on a project together uh, or getting coffee together, learning to trust each other and to know each other. Yeah. And and then I mean, all of us come out of our own experiences and then coming together with people who have different experiences and, and different backgrounds, that's really, that's really going to be important in terms of, of any kind of ministry, really. Yeah, and particularly in a day where people talk past one yes. another yes. or about one another instead of to one right. another. Right, right, yeah. right. So, uh, Russell, uh, let's pivot just a tad. After serving as president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the SBC for a good chunk of time, mm -hmm. 2013 to 2021, uh, you resigned that position mm -hmm. and soon thereafter left the denomination. Uh, now, at a bit of remove, mm -hmm. I wonder, would you be willing to reflect a bit allowed upon those decisions? Well, I wouldn't really consider it leaving the denomination because, okay. of course, in, in Baptist life, uh, you, you don't join 
uh, a, Fair a Baptist convention. Yep. You're, you're part of a, yep. a church. Local congregation. Uh, I'm part of a multi-denominational uh, congregation, but I'm still a Baptist yeah. and, uh, and still very much, um, very much uh, am, am Baptist to the core. And also am very appreciative of, um, of what Southern Baptist life gave to me yeah. from, from the yeah. first day. And the vast majority, I mean, what people sometimes don't realize is they look at the fights and they look at the uh, so-called, uh, what Amanda Ripley uh, would call the conflict entrepreneurs uh, <laughs> that are there. But that's generally a very, very small uh, group of people. And most of the people in Southern Baptist life are not those people that you hear behind the microphone. Yes. They're the people who yes. are the first uh, at a disaster site and the last to leave. Uh, and so it's, uh, I have very warm affection for that and, um, and, and a sense of co-laboring with it. Yeah. Those are the people in the church of your child. Yes, yes, and and people in churches all over the place, mm -hmm. and it's really uh, in almost every denomination now. One of the difficulties is that often uh, there was a time when it seemed that the healthiest people were the most engaged. Yes, in denominational life of whatever denomination, and the the unhealthiest people were the least. In many circumstances, in almost every institution in American life, that's reversed. Right. And so it, when it comes to whatever church structure or institution, for the people who are the, the healthiest, the most well-rounded, have the best sorts of aspirations and intentions, one almost has to talk them into taking one for the team yeah. uh, to serve in various ways <clears throat> because they're not concerned about yeah. having some title of serving on some associational committee or being on some. Uh, and instead, you have to show them how this actually does intersect with with God's call on your life and how important this is for ministry mm -hmm. rather than, uh, I mean, because the, the healthiest people aren't interested in all of the inside baseball conflicts that tend to happen in institutions right now. And if we're not careful, we could end up driving those people out uh, and then having a vicious cycle mm -hmm. uh, of that. And I'm really concerned about that with institutional life in America right now, in which almost every institution, maybe with the exception of the military, but almost every institution is dealing with lack of uh, credibility and confidence yeah. And with a, um, a a sense of an inability to do what institutions are meant to do, mm -hmm. and so that's that's really significant and important for the future, mm -hmm. and that means we need to we need to help engage those healthy people into those places of leadership. It's sometimes those who want to do it least who we need to do it That's most. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yes. <clears throat> Russell, you touch on something that I want to kind of, of uh, ask you to elaborate upon, this idea of the importance of institutions. Our friend Greg Jones talks about uh, tradition innovation mm -hmm. uh, and um, institutions, denominations, many feel as if though, you know, they have, uh, are going the way of all flesh. Um, why, why the importance of either? Why the importance of both? Well, with institutions, there's a connection between uh, the generations that came before mm -hmm. and a conserving and carrying on to the generations that come after. Uh, so uh, my friend uh, Tim Keller talks about the need for both institution and movement. Mm -hmm. Because if you have just movements, yes. then you, you have something that's very ephemeral, uh, often becomes personality-based and, and falls apart. If you only have institution, then you, you typically end up with hidebound uh, sort of 
we do it this way because we've all, always done it and that withers away and dies. But you have to have both of those uh, two things together. So the stability that comes with institutions along with that renewing and refreshing mm. uh, that, that comes along, which is, of course is exactly how Jesus designed the church mm. Mm. and healthy institutions reflect that. And so we're in a we're in a time in which uh, there's a warranted suspicion of institutions because we've seen so many institutions yeah. fail. Yeah. But we can overreact to mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. by saying, therefore, we live without institutions, which means all we end up with are institutions that are unintentional. <laughs> we don't we, we create, don't re them, we create right? them and we don't know that they're there and so we don't know how to govern them. Mm. So Russell, uh, speaking of looking back, you've looked I've asked you to look back a bit as on your term as president of the Ethics and um, uh, Religious Liberty Commission. I, I wonder as you look back, I mean, to, to my mind, you're still quite young. Thank you very much. <laughs> but, but as you look back now on, you know, um, a, a considerable career as um, a thinker, as a writer, as a public figure, um, I wonder if there are ways that you can pinpoint, identify. The, these mark some shifts in my own thinking. Well, there would be, there would be many of them, but uh, I think maybe a larger framework mm. of it would be in in two places. One of those would be there was a time uh, early on when looking around at a kind of cultural nominal Bible Belt Christianity, which yeah. which led me to uh, a real crisis as a as a teenager of wondering what's real and and what's just Southern culture and yeah. and so forth. Um, there was a time when I assumed this is because of a theological shallowness. Okay. Uh, and so therefore, if there's a robust theological framework, then that will answer the kind of nominal mm. cultural Christianity that mm -hmm. we see. What I have come to see is that actually uh, that's there can be a kind of robust theology that is just as nominal and just as cultural and brings all of those uh, all of those things with a kind of lifelessness mm. and so it's way truth and life and all of those mm. things have to be mm. have to be held together uh, and and that's especially true when often uh, in American, especially American evangelical life, often what we think is theological reflection sometimes is just tribalism <laughs> and sometimes is, is focused only on uh, particular controversies of the moment. Right. Uh, and the other thing that I, I would say has shifted quite a bit is recognizing that there are many times in my life when I would identify what seemed to be a slippery slope uh, that, that could easily move uh, in a direction that would be bad and away from, from orthodoxy. What I have learned over the years is that C.S. Lewis was right when he said the devil doesn't send errors into the world one by one, but two by two on either side of the good. And so there are slippery slopes everywhere. And so often uh, it's in some things, I'm not talking about the, the central uh, sort of, but, but in many things, it's not so much where people end up as how they're getting there. Yeah. And so you can find people who actually have more commonality yeah. because they're actually getting to that place in the same way. Yeah. And so there are people in my life that, Earlier on, I would have thought, well, these are these are just uh, people in a completely different sort of tribe than I'm in that really not just in church life and not just in evangelical life, but in almost every area of life, all of that's being shaken up. Yeah. And I think we rightly lament in many cases the loss of uh, old alliances and coalitions, political parties yeah. or uh, or uh, communities or churches or denominations. And yet there's also a reordering. And there are a lot of people who previously, even if they didn't 
hate each other or fight with each other. They just mm -hmm. considered themselves to be in different worlds yeah. who now are realizing we're actually allies yeah. and we actually can contribute to one another. Uh, that's been something I've learned over, over the past several years. That's wonderful. So Russell, last night you were uh, at Baylor uh, University delivering the Ethics and Culture Lecture sponsored by Baylor's Honor College, Honors College. Um, it was a wonderful, wide-ranging lecture, I can attest. Uh, delighted to have heard it. You, you concluded your lecture, um, which was more than less a thoughtful plea for the reformation of evangelicalism in America particularly with, I think, uh, a purposefully provocative statement of pressing of the pressing need to, quote, make evangelicalism born again. As we draw our conversation to a close, I wonder if you might reflect upon what this might entail and how such a vision might actually gain traction. Well, there are some people who would say, evangelical Christianity is really just power, yeah. militarism, nationalism, what, what, whatever, because of some of the really awful and disturbing things that we have seen. Uh, my argument is, if that's the case, if there is no theological or lived core to evangelicalism except for that, then it means we shouldn't worry about evangelicalism. We just right. deal with those things. Right. The, the reason that the the reason that so many awful things are able to be done is because they come with the uh, with the presumed authority of evangelical Christianity in the same way that uh, the indulgences of the medieval Catholic Church had had behind them an understanding of, of purgatory and freedom from purgatory. So I think where we need to go is to reclaim what is best, in evangelicalism while reforming and, uh, as the scripture says, test all things, hold fast to what is good. And what is at the core of evangelical Christianity at its best is that emphasis on new birth, which means that the, the world is not divided up into good people and bad people. Mm. The, the world is made up of people, all mm. of them simultaneously created in the image of God and fallen and in need of grace. Yes. Uh, and so that, that ought to cause us not to demonize, but to really be on mission. Mm. And a great deal of what I see happening right now is a, is a lack of confidence in the power of the gospel mm. that can be replaced by a sort of pugilism and quarrelsomeness yeah. that can masquerade as conviction. Right. And the answer to that is genuine conviction and a genuine sense of being, as Paul put it, ministers of reconciliation. Mm. Mm. And that's the task. And I, I'm very hopeful about that because when I see, even as recently as last night, uh, talking to 20-year-old yes. uh, Christians there. God yes. is doing remarkable yes. things in the yeah. next generation. Yeah, they gathered. So I'm hopeful. They were gathering around you, Russell. It was wonderful to see. Uh, your, your reflections remind me of a statement from Dan DeHaan in a probably not very well-known book, The God You Can Know. Uh, DeHaan said that uh, Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. Ah, that's good. That's really good. And that seems to capture what we're after. And Russell, uh, in your new roles at Christianity Today, not only editor-in-chief of this remarkable flagship magazine, which is in print and digital, uh, making its way to millions throughout the world, but you're also leading uh, this very important uh, project of, of public uh, theology. I wonder if you could just elaborate upon that just a bit and perhaps link it to this um, uh uh, what conversion of evangelicalism once again? Well, I think one of the great needs and, and what's the driving factor uh, behind uh, all of that is a need for clarity with sanity, uh, which is I think that we're, we're at a place in which um, reasonableness, which the, the scripture repeatedly says is, is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, uh, can be diminished. In, in light of the spectacular. Hmm. 
And also, because one of the uh, one of the convictions that I've had since being a seminary professor training uh, young pastors and ministers, I would always try an ethics class to have a final exam that would find some issue that is uh, futuristic or outlandish enough that the people in the room had never thought about it before and to complicate it to the point that I didn't know the answer to it. Because what I didn't want what was for students simply to say, okay, well, what are the right answers that I need to put? And instead see, how are you working through and confronting uh, new challenges that don't fit into previous categories drawing from the word of God? That's something that is really pressing for Christians right now, because often we're, we're, uh, trained up on issues that have passed away when we're not ready to deal with the issues that are coming. Hmm. So artificial hmm. intelligence, yes. augmented reality. I mean, there are so many things that are going to affect the church greatly, but they seem to be uh, futuristic uh, science fiction until yeah. they're right here and ubiquitous. Yes. So teaching and, and trying to model for people how to, how to, shape and to hone those consciences and intuitions, not just the data of, yeah. of what we know yeah. is, is part of the goal. Wonderful. Russell, thank you for your time. Grateful for our conversation. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm.